There's so much talk about 3D printing lately. 3D printing here, 3D printing there. Have you ever wondered how all of this works and how complicated it is to make something 3D printed? Well, I'm currently making a 3D printed Christmas present. So let me show you how to get from not having a 3D print to something like this. There are different kinds of 3D printers. The most common type to have as a private person is the FFF or sometimes called FDM 3D printer. It prints by melting plastic filament and placing layers of molten plastic with this movable print head. I also have an SLA printer over here. That one works by solidifying liquid resin with ultraviolet light. But let's stick with the filament printer for today. We now really want to start 3D printing, so what are the necessary steps for that? A 3D printing workflow generally consists of acquiring a model, preparing the model for printing, slicing, which is the process of generating printable layers that tell the 3D printer what to do, the actual 3D printing, and maybe some post-processing such as sanding or painting the finished and 3D printed object. Let's have a look at each of these steps. First, we need a 3D model. We could design one. This is normally done with some CAD software like FreeCAD, OpenSCAD or Fusion 360. But we can also simply find something we want to print online and download it. There are various websites that offer free or paid 3D models. I'm mostly using Thingiverse and My Mini Factory to get cool 3D models. I found the lamp that I'm making today on Thingiverse and you can check the link to that in the description. Once we have a model that we want to print, we download it and normally we get one or more STL files. STL is more or less the standard for 3D printing and I've only ever gotten STL files when downloading models for printing. We have successfully acquired a 3D model. Now what? Well, we need a 3D printer. I have my printer back here and these have gotten pretty cheap over the last few years. But you don't actually need your own 3D printer. Maybe a friend of yours has one or your workplace. And if not, you can check if there is a makerspace or a hackerspace near you. These spaces often have really cool tools for you to use. I've put a link of hackerspaces in the video description. The 3D model that we downloaded is most likely an STL file and the 3D printer doesn't understand that format. So we need a software that tells the printer exactly what to do. Such a software is called a slicer because it slices the model into printable layers. But it usually does much more than just slicing. I'm mostly using Cura or Prusa Slicer for that purpose. Both tools are available for free. Many slicers are quite powerful. We can even edit the 3D model a bit. But what we generally want to do is to find a good orientation for the 3D model and if necessary add some support structure. You see, a 3D printer cannot print on thin air. Because it's printing with molten plastic, the molten mass wants to drop down. Mostly outward slopes of up to 45 degrees or sometimes more are not an issue. And with some limitations, we can even print straight lines on thin air if something is supporting it on both ends. When we import a model into the slicer and simply select slice, then we get the sliced model. Most often the default is a hollow model with some support structures inside that are called infill. The infill make the object more stable and also allow it to be closed on top without any issues. With this model we can see that a large part is not supported by anything beneath it. This will fail if we try to print it. That's why it's a good idea to think about a good orientation for the print. Let's rotate it around a bit. That's much better. It should be printable. However, only a very small area touches the build plate. This might be a problem because the object may detach and tip over during the print. So I will add some supports. We now have a much larger area that sticks to the build plate and it should be way more stable. The supports also make sure that the overhang regions have something to be printed on. We can now export the sliced model as a G-code file. G-code are simple commands that the 3D printer can understand. They basically tell the printer, heat up your nozzle, move your head to these coordinates, extrude filament, move the head, stop extruding, and so on. Most printers will have a slot for a memory card or a USB drive where it will read the G-code file from. Some printers also offer a web interface. 
I really recommend Octopi, which allows you to control the printer with an attached Raspberry Pi computer over a nice web interface. Check out the links in the description if you want to learn more. Before we print, we need to make sure that the print bed is level, which means that the nozzle has the same distance to the bed no matter where it is on the X and Y axis. You can find many guides on how to level your 3D printer on the web. It is not necessary to do this every time, generally checking this every few weeks should suffice. Or of course, if you notice any issues. When starting the print, I like to watch it at least until the first layer is finished. Most failed prints have issues already on the first layer and this way we can catch them early. After that, it's time to wait. Some models can print for days. This one takes about 9 hours. And here we go, we have a bunch of 3D printed parts. Some of them needed support structure and we now need to carefully remove those. I'm done removing the support structures, this actually took me a few hours. It's a good idea to wear protective goggles because this stuff sometimes flies around through the room when you try to pry it off. And this actually took me a few hours, which is why I don't really like support structures. For these parts I needed support structures. If we print it upright like this, we have all this inner part which is an overhang here. I could have printed it in this orientation like I did with that other part. However, you may be able to see that the surface won't be as nice and smooth if we do it this way. So I prefer to print it uh, on the side like this. If I was to redesign this part, I would try to avoid having to add support structures by avoiding these 90 degree overhang angles. Instead, I would try to fill this corner up with a 45 degree material. Of course, we would have less space in here, but there's ways to go get around this. So yeah, keep that in mind when designing for 3D printing, you can avoid um, support structures in most cases. 3D printed parts don't always perfectly fit together. If they don't fit, we can make them fit by carefully cutting part pieces away, by sanding them down or using heat from a heat gun or maybe a lighter to warm the plastic up and carefully bending it the way we want. We'll use the sanding technique here. Let's see how the rest of this fits together. At this point we could just glue it together and we would be done, but if we want the best results maybe we want to sand it down and give it a nice color finish. When sanding 3D prints I prefer powered tools, of course you can also do this by hand, but it's a lot faster using something like this. Start with something coarse like 80 grit sandpaper and then work your way up, up until very fine. Possibly even adding some water to the very fine grits for the best results. And wear protection. Okay, we're done sanding. In the meantime, I have started one last 3D print that we may or may not need for this whole lamp to work. One of the parts has such an uneven surface that I cannot smooth it out with sanding. So I decided to cover it with a layer of epoxy resin. This epoxy is called XTC3D and it's specifically meant to smooth out 3D prints. It has a strong odor, so I prefer to wear a mask, even though it doesn't state that you have to do that. Each layer of epoxy needs to dry for a few hours. In the meantime, I'll color the other parts. We'll use spray paint to give the parts some nice color. But first, let's use some filler to smooth it out even more and some primer to make the color stick to the parts. 
Also, I like to do this outside because of the smell and because some of the color tends to escape. It's a new day. All the epoxy and primer has dried and the last 3D print is finished. I just realized if I attach the parts like this, we have these very noticeable gaps in between and I'm thinking whether we can get rid of them somehow. Maybe it's time for another round of epoxy. I first used some glue to put the parts together. Often super glue works great for 3D prints, but it might not always be the best solution. I am not an expert on glue. After the glue is dried, I fill the gaps with epoxy and let that dry as well. And since the applied epoxy gives us new bumps on the surface, it's time to sand it back down again. Okay, so now that everything is glued together and sanded for a second time, we can hopefully give it the final color we want. Since we are building a lamp, we also need something that creates light. These LED strips are very convenient as you can simply cut them at the markings to get the desired length. The LED strip also comes with some sticky tape on the back so it's easy to install in the lamp. We don't want the LED strip to be directly visible, so I glue in the 3D printed diffusers, which are simply thin strips of two layers of white plastic mm. filament. So there we have it, we made a nice 3D printed lab. You now know how to get a digital 3D model, that you need a slicer software to turn the digital 3D model into code that the 3D printer understands, that the 3D printing itself consists mostly of waiting, although to be honest, 3D printing also often means to look for problems why something didn't print the way you want. So if you get print failures, don't be discouraged. Just try and find the error and I think it's worth it in the end. I often use the 3D prints just the way they come out of the printer, but if we want something nicer, we may want to do some post-processing like we did with this lamp here. If you're now interested in 3D printing, there's a ton of information out there on the web. I made a slightly more detailed blog post a while ago and I will link that in the description, but there's a lot more information on YouTube or on many other places. I made this video to be shown by the Swabian Embassy at the Remote Chaos Experience. It's the big online event by the German Chaos Computer Club. But the video will also be available on my YouTube channel. If you're watching at the RC3 and want to see more videos like this, you can check out my channel at youtube.com slash That's it for this time. Thanks for watching and see you next time on Matumakes.